In January 2010, a corporate-owned Supreme Court changed our country from a democratic republic to a plutocracy. The Citizens United ruling declared that it's okay for corporations to spend unlimited money to influence people to vote for their chosen political candidates. In effect, the Supreme Court took our country away from us and gave it to the corporate world. Corporations are people, my friend. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. America is being torn apart. Our citizens are so politically divided that we can't even have a constructive conversation. You can't argue with ignorance. And he wants an argument, and you can't argue with his ignorance because it's not going to prove a thing. So who's responsible for this? Big business has been controlling our country with dishonesty, deception, and selfish motivation. The corporate-controlled news media has driven a wedge between us by replacing truth and accuracy with biased rhetoric and misinformation. Instead of getting factual news, many people tune into a source of news that's tailored to what they want to hear. Whether you tune into Fox News or MSNBC or even CNN, the media has a direct correlation to the way uh, the, the general public's opinions are formed. Special interest groups have been tricking misinformed citizens into voting for the politicians they want in Congress by controlling the conversation from the media to the pulpit and even to your dinner table. They are very crafty in figuring out who exactly their target audience is and then feeding them what they want to hear versus feeding them the truth. I listen to the left and I listen to the right. I set out on a journey to expose this corrupt relationship, how it affects our quality of life and what we can do about it. Along the way, I uncovered some shocking facts about every industry that impacts us, from healthcare to our food supply. I think I hear his voice. The petrochemical industry has the largest and most adverse impact on our daily lives. Petroleum is used in thousands of plastic, pharmaceutical, and agricultural products. But by far, their biggest cash cow is the automobile, and they will use any means necessary to keep it that way. In the early 1990s, General Motors acquired the rights to an innovative new battery and introduced the EV1 electric vehicle. I got the opportunity to drive the EV1 in 2000. You could plug it in when you got home at night and uh, you didn't have to really think about it. And the next morning it was all charged up and ready to go. For two, uh, as a commuter car, it was fine. I could keep up with traffic without any problem. It had a range of about 70 miles. The later model that I drove on some months later went uh, 80 to 90 miles. In October 2000, GM sold its rights to Texaco, and a week later, Texaco was acquired by Chevron. The EV1 uh, went away at its demise, um, and all the cars, unfortunately, were destroyed. Um, nobody was given the option to keep any of the cars, so they, they all went away. They all disappeared. The EV1 posed some threats to the oil industry, and uh, GM saw that it was going down a path that was in a way very successful, but maybe potentially could be costly. Uh, they saw at the time that that was in the best interest to uh, snuff it out and try to erase it from people's memory. Ask yourself, why would GM, with a 15-year jump on the rest of the auto industry, sell its battery technology to an oil company? Who owns GM? Could it be the oil industry? Oil companies have been purchasing alternative energy and transportation technology advances for years and suppressing them to ensure their profits grow. They not only control the way we drive, 
but also have serious effects on the quality of our lives. Climate change, oil spills, and geopolitical conflict are just a few of the consequences. Breaking us down Trying the best to break us down Breaking us down Trying their best to break us down Here comes the man Yeah, the main thing that uh, we're seeing as climate change has progressed is that the polar regions of the Earth are in general really sensitive. They change a lot more than the temperate latitudes do. And so you'll find very few people that work in the field in glaciology who aren't thinking that right now is a, an amazing time of change for, for the polar regions. Something radical is happening to the Earth. One of the key ways that we have to monitor and understand the changes in the ice sheets are uh, satellite data. The other thing that's eventually going to impact all of this is an increase in sea level rise. We're already seeing that, but it's hard to make it clear how important it is when you're talking about a rise from past centuries where it was two millimeters to three millimeters per year. That doesn't sound like much, but it's we're at the very beginning of the changes we expect to see in the cryosphere. And by the end of the century, it's looking as though we could see a meter more sea level than we have uh, today, on the order of a meter more. Some believe that U.S. military involvement in Central Asia is by and large about oil. According to a December 1997 article in The Telegraph, a British newspaper, Unocal, a U.S. oil company, had been negotiating with the Taliban since 1995 to build oil and gas pipelines through Afghanistan. Looking at a map of the American military bases created for the war in Afghanistan, one is struck by the fact that they are located along the route of the projected oil pipeline to the Indian Ocean. Who planned this? Who authorized it? And why? Big Oil has spent billions to build relationships with Congress and will stop at nothing to attain greater profits. But we now know that Saddam has resumed his efforts to acquire nuclear weapons. We cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. The president this morning has spoken with three foreign leaders. He began with Prime Minister Blair, where the two discussed the ongoing aspects of Operation Iraqi uh, Liberation. Well, the, the point the president is making is he is visiting many of the places that are involved in uh, Operation Iraqi Liberation. My fellow Americans, major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. The intelligence that we were operating off was, uh, was correct. The quality of our intelligence operation, I think we're better than anybody else. We gathered a lot of intelligence. That intelligence was good, sound intelligence. There are a lot of people who lie and get away with it, and, and uh, that's just a fact. Dwight Eisenhower was a five-star general in the United States Army during World War II. He planned and supervised the successful D-Day liberation of Europe on June 6, 1944. 
After serving two terms as President of the United States, Ike issued this prophetic warning to our nation in his farewell speech. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. By controlling the media and Congress, the weapons industry tries to convince us that we are under the constant threat of being attacked and that we need these weapons to defend us. Large defense companies support politicians in every state with large campaign contributions to help them get reelected. In return, these politicians reward them with military contracts. This strategy is called the military-industrial complex, or more bluntly, the military-industrial congressional complex. Take a look at this list of the 10 biggest government contractors. They're all defense contractors, and every one of them gets most of its revenues from the federal government. They use some of that money to lobby for even more defense contracts. Why should you and I and every other taxpayer pay Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Boeing to lobby and give away money to politicians who will vote for even more aerospace weapon systems? The answer is we shouldn't. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all, in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. What we pay for one aircraft carrier can send 643,286 kids to college can give 895, 641 families health care, can build 60,865 homes. We spend our tax dollars on weapons of war that we don't need and will probably never use to defend our country. Yet, we can't feed, shelter, or take care of our military veterans? We can't feed starving people in our country? We can't provide a health care system to help sick, injured, and disabled people like every other civilized country does? We can't provide a quality education for the young people who are our future? Then tell me, what the hell are we fighting for? Our military is being sacrificed to further global corporate profits with the help of a corrupt Congress. Citizens against corporate greed have been singled out as the new enemy. We can't keep spending as if deficits don't have consequences, as if waste doesn't matter. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. <laughs> The United States is the only modern country in the world, including China and Russia, that doesn't have a national health care plan. Our health care system is based on profit rather than the welfare of our citizens. 48,000 people die in the U.S. each year because they can't afford health care, and our average lifespan of 78 years is 50th among 221 nations. We also rank last in the quality of health care compared to similar civilized countries. High deductibles, co-payments, and out-of-pocket costs force insured people in the U.S. to struggle to pay for required health care. We spend more on health care per capita than any other modern nation, and we rank 46th among the 48 countries with the most efficient health care systems. So why are health care costs so high in the United States? The AMA commissioned the Flexner Report in 1910, which stated substandard medical schools were supplying second-rate doctors. They convinced Congress to shut down what they considered to be substandard medical schools. This drastically reduced the supply of doctors by almost 30% over the next 30 years. 
This decision resulted in a massive shortage of physicians. U.S. doctors charge twice as much as their European colleagues, which is one key reason for the high health care costs in America. Doctors claim that malpractice insurance is the reason for the high cost of health care. But in reality, its premiums amount to well under 1% of the total U.S. health care bill. How much do you all think I pay for medical malpractice each year? 40,000? 60. 60. Anyone want to shout out the number for me? $3,048.46.48. Most doctors don't pay a whole lot more than I do. Surgeons pay about $18,000 a year, orthopedic $20,000 a year. They can afford it though. They make a lot more than I do. And certainly I don't think most people guess that my medical malpractice is one-sixth the price of our health care insurance. Hospital charges represent about one-third of the annual United States health care bill and cost on average five times more than any other civilized country. They use a price list called the Charge Master, and almost everything is irrationally priced. A penny aspirin could cost you upwards of $20 in a hospital setting. Prescription drug prices in the U.S. are 5 to 117 percent higher compared to other countries. The pharmaceutical industry claims that the reason the price of their drugs are so high is because of the research and development costs of their new products. But BMJ, a medical journal based in London, stated, For every dollar a pharmaceutical company spends on basic research, $19 goes toward promotion and marketing. Big Pharma could easily cut their prices significantly without affecting their research and development programs in any way. The U.S. is the only highly developed country that does not regulate drug costs in some way. Governments in other countries take advantage of their bargaining power to negotiate prices with drug companies. Why won't our government representatives negotiate with big drug companies on our behalf? The U.S. Congress, who write the laws that are supposed to protect us, are bought and paid for by the special interest groups who represent the pharmaceutical industry. And that leads us to one of the biggest scams ever perpetrated on the American public. Health care insurance. Until the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, health insurance companies could refuse to accept anyone because of a pre-existing health condition. If you made an honest mistake on your insurance application, they could cancel your benefits and declare your policy invalid from the day it began. They could set a dollar limit on their yearly spending and a lifetime limit for your covered benefits. Insurers are now required to cover certain preventive services at no cost to you and must make coverage available to children up to age 26. The for-profit healthcare insurance company's goal is to collect as many premiums as possible while paying out the least amount of claims. A person having paid premiums for years could suddenly discover that the low-priced insurance that they were paying bargain rates for wasn't worth the paper it was written on. The healthcare insurance company's greed has cost thousands of patients their lives because they could not get life-saving medical services. As long as our healthcare system is based on profit, Americans will never be secure in their health needs. We need universal health care, just like every other civilized country in the world has. Small family farms that were once the mainstay of our fresh food in America are disappearing. The small farm uh, uh, demise started in the uh, late 1960s. Um, higher uh, land values and development pressure was the initial thrust of it. Uh, but the large corporations that process the food uh, and deliver it to the end consumer uh, started to realize it was a lot better to go to, a, say, a 1,000 cow dairy farm to pick up milk than it is to go to 250 cow dairy farms. Farming in the United States is becoming increasingly dominated by large agricultural conglomerates. Ten of the largest food processing corporations in the world control most of the products we buy in our local supermarkets. If we are what we eat, then we're in trouble. An addictive diet of heavily processed foods, high in salt, sugars, and fats has resulted in one out of every three Americans being classified as obese. And growing evidence suggests that some ingredients in processed foods are responsible for many serious health issues. Maximizing their profits is their primary goal. 
and addiction is the primary vehicle used to get there. You need to stop and think about what you're eating. Uh, most of us as consumers who are not related to a farm, if it's not wrapped in saran wrap or in a shiny vacuum packed package, uh, we're not sure where it came from. And I will tell you that the healthiest food comes when you go and find a local source of it. Special interest groups for these junk food titans constantly manipulate their pawns in Congress to pass regulations that favor them and stack more rules and regulations onto the backs of small farmers. Well, many times regulations are a big problem. Uh, for instance, uh, EPA uh, comes out with different water restrictions and things of this nature. Farmers, uh, there isn't no mo monetary help many times to get them through that hurdle to meet them recommendations. So instead of working with them, many times they'll just fine them. And naturally, that, that depletes their bankroll and sooner or later they'll go out of business. Agricultural conglomerates and food processing corporations completely dominate the industry. They've taken countless numbers of farmers to court for alleged patent violations. So Monsanto can basically patent their seed per, for profit and then they can sue you rather than allowing you to sue them for they they contaminate your organic field and they're going to sue you that's like if i'm spray painting my car in my driveway and some of my paint splatters on your house and then i sue you for having my paint on your house the united states congress uses your tax money to go after small farmers in hundreds of different ways while leaving big campaign contributors pretty much alone you're seeing rules and regulations being put in place that are creating uh, the push uh, toward the larger farm. Eventually, the big corporations and the federal government will have near total control over food production in America. Every day we see another story about issues surrounding the safety of GMOs. Many groups are fighting for the mandatory labeling of foods containing GMOs. I think that GMO labeling is fine. I think it should be required. I think it's a, a very important issue. Evidence suggests that most GMO research is done by the GMO companies themselves. The problem is that the American public operates in the dark. We deserve to know what we are putting into our bodies. Our customers want to know that our cows are fed with non-GMO products. Uh, and it's not that hard to do. The corn is out there and I think you're going to see Actually, conventional corns make a little bit of a comeback because there is a, a market for them and, and they're not allowed to be sold in Europe at all. There still remain many unanswered questions about GMOs, and it's time we get answers. People wonder why, no matter who we vote for, almost nothing ever changes. The answer lies in how our country is being run and who the government really is. Almost everything that happens in our country happens because it benefits the bottom line of some major interest group. A pact, commonly called the Iron Triangle, is what really determines our quality of life, regardless of gender, race, religion, or political affiliation. At the top of the triangle is Congress, where congressional committees write laws, policies, and approve budgets that affect our lives. At the second corner of the triangle are the bureaucrats. Their job is to put government policies into action, regulate, and enforce them. And at the third corner are the special interest groups who are directly affected by the policies written in Congress. Originally, special interest groups were meant to be the voice of the people to allow access to our government. Let's suppose an energy company wants to have laws written that will allow them to use coal-burning power plants without the use of anti-pollution devices. They could give a politician that sits on the Energy Committee electoral support to influence their re-election. That politician returns the favor by supporting friendly legislation and oversight to their donors. Simultaneously, that politician is funding and supporting the bureaucrats responsible for enforcing the laws and regulations for the energy company. So, for the benefit of job security, those bureaucrats scratch the politicians back by supporting their policies and writing regulatory laws that favor the energy company. As a reward, the energy company's lobbyists politically support the bureaucrats. By controlling the lawmakers in Washington, big business is essentially running the government. Or, to put it more accurately, they are the government. 
Decisions made in Congress generally have very little to do with the wishes of the average American. The only part we play is to vote these politicians into positions of power that usually result in a conflict of interest. And to add insult to injury, these politicians usually end up as lobbyists with the industries that they supported. How are they getting away with this? Our media is locked inside of the Iron Triangle. Almost everything we see or hear is controlled by six massive corporations. Think about that. Six corporate CEOs controlling almost 90% of the news. The media drives the public's opinion, basically speaking. The First Amendment to the Constitution guarantees freedom of expression by prohibiting Congress from restricting the press or the rights of individuals to speak freely. The media is supposed to be the people's guardian. When we watch the news, read a newspaper, or watch a current event show, we expect to be truthfully and accurately informed. But what we often get are facts that have been skillfully manipulated to support the political agenda of a major corporation. When you're looking to make a dollar off of advertising, when you're trying to get the highest ratings possible, you're just you're, you're spewing headlines that kind of skew the truth. You're, you're taking facts and kind of twisting them to get ratings. That's not news anymore. Their formula is simple. Create an agenda-driven fear in the public through the media. The Iraqi regime possesses biological and chemical weapons. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. That Saddam has resumed his efforts to acquire nuclear weapons. Use an event as a reason to drive their agenda forward. and target a scapegoat that stands in the way of achieving their goals. With respect to 9-11, of course, you've had the um, uh, story that's been public out there, the Czechs uh, alleged that uh, Mohammed Atta, the lead attacker, met uh, in Prague with a senior Iraqi intelligence official five months before the attack. Saddam Hussein um, cavorts with terrorists. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. Instead of functioning as the guardian of democracy, the media has become a tool of special interest groups and politicians. The biggest problem that America faces right now is that we do not have a credible source of news. You have to know that whatever you're getting, wherever you're getting it, is probably half the truth, or at least not the full truth. We are being subjected to a distorted news content designed to keep America's ignorant and misinformed. A large percentage of the media, in fear of losing their jobs, have deserted the ethics of their profession. While the few who have chosen to honor their journalistic integrity to the public often pay the price by being exiled from their profession. Their bottom line isn't to necessarily inform you of the truth, it's to serve their agenda. Whatever that talk show person, whether it be the talk show person's agenda, the network's agenda, the advertiser's agenda, it's not about giving you fact, it's about, it's about satisfying their own personal agendas. Editorial decisions are made to satisfy their advertisers, the special interest groups, to boost their ratings, and to benefit their bottom lines. At the end of the day, it all comes down to making money. It all comes down to getting the best ratings. If we can't believe what we see and hear in the media, then how are we supposed to make informed decisions that directly impact our lives? And this, this dynamic of having news in our country that's paid programming, so to speak, through advertising, is really where the breakdown happens. Fortunately, Americans are becoming aware and realizing that corporate controlled media cannot be completely trusted. So it's up to us as Americans to be seekers of the truth and consider everything and read everything and watch everything and then come to our own conclusions. But do not, try not to rely on one source of news because it's probably not completely accurate. I was once asked while traveling in Europe, why is there such a big debate in America over health care? Don't American people care about each other? <laughs> I couldn't honestly answer that question. Do we care if someone is sick and needs health care? Do we care about people starving in America? Do we care if a gifted young person can't afford a college education?
There are some very special people who did answer that question. They made the ultimate sacrifice so that we could pursue the American dream. They didn't see race or nationality. They didn't see political affiliations or religious beliefs. They didn't see any differences. They just saw us, the people. We live in a huge country. Some live in rural areas, where most of our neighbors look like us, hunt, fish, or farm for their daily meals, and depend on their neighbors for support. Others live in urban areas, where people from all over the world mix together in a jumble of humanity, where the local supermarket is the source for our daily meals, where we depend on public services for our needs and support, where firearms are seen as a weapon rather than a means to secure food. We owe it to our heroes to have a conversation between our rural and our urban neighbors, to understand that many of us live in very different environments and that everyone does not have the same opportunities. We are all different, but we all desire the same things. Good health, solid education, a fair justice system, enough money for a decent quality of life, the ability to care for the people we love, and a country we can be proud of and trust. We have to recognize that we are purposely being divided by politicians and big business to further their greedy agendas. We are all Americans. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. We must demand truthful, accurate, and unbiased reporting from our media and understand that the news we want to hear is often the news that will hurt us the most. Being informed is the only way that we can improve our country. We must come together, use our voices, question everything, vote, protest, and seek the truth. United, we will stand. Divided, we will fall. We are the people. And all around me, a voice was sounding. This land was made for you and me. When the sun comes shining, as I was strolling, and the wheat fields waving, and the dust clouds rolling, as the fog was lifting, the voice was chanting. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land. From California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. This land was made for you and me.